Hi. There you go. There you are. Hey. <laughs> Welcome. You got it taken care of. So, for anybody, we had a little delay. Uh, Joe here is on some old school technology, I guess, right? Military grade? <laughs> Did you get it? <laughs> No. It's probably just bright. So you're in North Carolina, so we're going to really battle it out. Yeah. Yes, we are. Big one's on Saturday. Right. So we're going to, me and Joe, we're going to talk about, I'm going to take the Austrian economic side, and he is going to, to explain, I guess, defend, explain, confront from their perspective, the monetarist or Chicago school view. Correct. Yes. Cool. And then it won't. It'll be a little bit debatey. I think we'll probably just have a nice discussion, and we can kind of go back and forth a little bit. And the, I guess, probably the main areas that we had said we were going to talk about were involving money and the business cycle. <clears throat> and I think we agree. So actually, I I like Friedman a lot. So I think Friedman's really cool. I use a lot of his videos in my courses that I teach. And so, <clears throat> you froze there. <clears throat> and so I, I, I like Friedman, I think he's really interesting. He's a real brilliant guy, he wrote a lot of great books. And there are just a few, well, actually a lot of issues that some of the, the Austrian economists take issue with as far as, especially if you're a hardcore libertarian, Austrian, T typically libertarians and Austrian economists tend to go well together. Like if you're one, you're going to become the other is generally how it goes. You there? Uh, you went to your, looks like you, you cut off. Is your computer okay? Okay, well, <clears throat> hopefully he'll come back. He's not too far gone. He's having some computer issues again, so I'm, you know, one guy watched some. Okay, so I'm just hoping that we can get John Locke his namesake anyways, back. So I'm gonna talk about number one is money. So from, well, actually I should say Austrian, the Austrian School of Economics has nothing to do with, as, as Robert Murphy says, that it has nothing to do with the GDP of Vienna or something. It's just that the founders, the guys that originally developed the ideas were from Austria. And at the time, to be back in like the 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s. We have Frank von Mises and Hayek and some of the some of the foundational Austrians, uh, and there's a lot of them today. I suggest Robert P. Murphy. I've got one of his books right here. If you're interested in healthcare and free market healthcare, primal prescription, I am just getting into it a little bit. He's my favorite economist, funny guy, contrakrugman.com, all that. So if you're interested more in that kind of stuff. And he's still he's still gone. So I'll keep going. <clears throat> um, so that's kind of where the origination of Austrian economics is. Austrian economics, I think you can associate it with free market economics. It's not generally Austrians consider themselves. Hey, you're back. You got it. Yeah, I'm good. I'm, I'm still listening to you. I just have to get on my phone now. Okay. Oh. So it works on the phone. That's cool. So I was just kind of explaining the origin of the Austrian economic, th economic theories that they were from Hayek and Mises and them. And yep. that they were concerned with the business cycle and they, money. And those are kind of the main areas that I find interesting about Austrian economics. Now, I will say I am not an expert in Austrian economics. I just really, I'm, I'm an economist, and I really like the, the Austrian economists, and I think they're fascinating individuals, and I think they make excellent, excellent points. So Austrian is just kind of, it's a way to describe the world and how it works. It's not a, it's not what's called a free market economic theory. It's not a, an application of how the world should be. It's just, it kind of explains how the world works. So did you want to talk about monetary theory now or Chicago school? I think I can give a brief description of Chicago school. 
I think we, I think starting off with the history kind of gives everybody a good idea. So the history of the Chicago School really starts with uh, uh, a man named Frank H. Knight, who is the what's considered the godfather of Chicagoan economics. Now, Chicagoan economics was really America's foremost school of economics, uh, University of Chicago. Uh, it has produced the most Nobel Prize winners of any any school, let alone any uh, any school of thought. So Frank H. Knight uh, had put to, had an assembled a team of Jacob Viner, Stiglitz, Milton Friedman, uh, and and uh, a couple others who were trying to use the foundations of the free market and laissez-faire economics that's come from the French and, and from uh, Adam Smith to really get a, to really a good understanding of uh, the Great Depression, risk and uncertainty, monetary policy, uh, trade and regulation. And they come together and they were really the first to take uh, – neoclassical to the point of science whereas neoclassicals kind of took it as well it's kind of a soft science it's a, it's a social science it's not it's not 100 percent right well they for the better part did the most modeling work out of any other economist which really led to it being such a famous school and this positivist attitude was foundational to why they became such a big and such an important part of economics. Um, as for the monetary policy, um, it has changed over time. When I speak specifically of Chicago, I'm not just going to rant about uh, Milton Friedman's monetary policy and monetarism. There is also what's called market monetarism, which is uh, a little bit classier, a little bit more dressed up version of it. Uh, that's from Scott Sumner from the University of Chicago, who is now uh, the head of monetary policy at uh, uh, George Mason University's Mercatus Center. But he's still one of the one of the last Chicago boys. And when it comes to the business cycle, uh, I don't think anybody has put more work into counter cyclical uh, policies than the Chicago School. Um, you're free to talk about why do you think uh, Austrian is superior? So you kind of you mentioned right at the your last statement there that they have counter cyclical policies, and this is just one area where Austrians and and the Chicago School would differ, as well as you mentioned as a science. And so I don't think Austrians would generally say that think of economics in terms of this as much of a science. Uh, There's a funny, I remember one of Bob Murphy's presentations, he had like a, a chart and it said one, 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 one. And he kind of joked that people say Austrians can't do math. And uh, well, I'm a math major, so I can do math. But, but Austrians generally look at the intuitiveness of behavior. And that's what really got me interested in economics period is the idea of behavioral economics and how people act due to incentives and things like that. It's not as much mathematical modeling as monetary theory, but you're, so again, back to your, your last statement there is that there's a lot in Chicago school is an application of how certain policies that should be enacted when say the economy goes into recession or something. Would you say, would you, is that some, uh, yes. Well, I mean, there is preemptive counter-cyclical policy, so, but yeah, for the most part, we can attribute it to that. Yeah, and so Austrians would generally not get into, well, this policy should be done or that, but they, they would more explain how policies will have an effect on the economy. And so the, the basic idea is the business cycle, the Austrian business cycle, which is you you're going to go through like it, it, it's sort of based on banking and the interest rate and that low in, interest rates are like any other thing. Money is like any other commodity. It's the only difference is that money is used in every transaction. And so interest rates are the price of the commodity money. 
And we know that, and we all agree that prices give information and prices tell you when things are relatively scarce. So the problem comes in when you have a central bank that Friedman was in favor of a central bank. He didn't like gold. I think mean, that was a big, a big difference that the, the two schools have is the idea of gold and commodity back. Well, not necessarily commodity backed money. I mean, there was a paper Friedman wrote on commodity backed money, but he didn't really, he wasn't in favor of that. Uh, so I think this, this is a big part of it. And, and it's the, so the business cycle is that when you start to, you get a boom, it's driven by low interest rates, low interest rates, we would say fool entrepreneurs, and we're not saying entrepreneurs are idiots, so they fall a prey to this, but just the idea that entrepreneurs look at low interest rates, they think that there's an abundance of demand and abundance of relatively unscarce um, assets, and so they will go when they will make long-term investments based on low interest rates, and then as the, as the economy starts to boom, the interest rates start to creep up, and because those long-term investments were based on low interest rates, when the interest rate rises, they start to go bust, and you get that crash. And then the crash, the healing process, I, I like to compare it, I would talk about when you guys go out on a Friday night with your friends, so you were in the military, no doubt you know all about this. <laughs> yes. Go out. Anyway. Go ahead. I was just going to say, so you probably did this in the, I, I was never into drinking. So even in college, not the night, uh, but you probably go out with your friends, you get drunk, right? Maybe pass out. You get into this. That's like the, the boom, the twenties, 2002 through 2006, you get this really good feeling of alcohol pouring through the brain, the veins into the brain. And then the bust is like when you, you just can't drink anymore. You start, you get to that point to where you can't hold it anymore. And that's the peak, and then you start puking, and that's when that's when you start to feel bad. Uh, it's the hangover, right? The next day, that that's what a recession is like. And what do you do during a recession? Well, the temptation is to be Barney from The Simpsons and keep drinking to like stave off that recession, i.e., more low interest rates. But the recession is really the healing process. The recession is good, and so again, Austrians were just describing this is how the business cycle works and how the economy and how entrepreneurs and individuals react to changes in, in the interest rate. And that's really what I think where it kind of centers on. <clears throat> okay. Um, can you hear me? I'll jump to a different laptop to make sure. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. So <laughs> when it comes to the Austrian business cycle, and here's one point to make. The, the Austrian business cycle theory is extremely – truncated into what would actually happen with low interest rates. Uh, Milton Friedman said low interest rates are not are not a, a signal to say that there is increased money into the system, but it's actually really saying that there's not enough money in the system because, like you said, uh, money has to fall under supply and demand. Interest rates are the signal for that supply and demand. But there's also, <laughs> but there's also the, the idea that that, that there's a demand for money which is greater than the supply of money which causes uh which causes things like deflation and those can happen without interest rates right those the, the market can run the interest rates and those can happen that's happened in the uh in the 1913 uh yeah 1913 bank runoffs where uh, the, the bankers actually had to step in and, and subsidize all the other smaller banks to make sure that this didn't happen so, and, and the Austrian business cycle really has no empirical evidence to, to facilitate the idea that these low interest rates cause these huge booms and then there's going to be a bust because there's the misallocation of resources, right? That the, the entrepreneur is fooled or, or something along those lines. Um, th there's, no reason to, there's no reason to make that assumption, really. That, that, that's kind of one of the crux of why I don't like Austrian economics is because it makes this assumption out of nowhere where most of the data and most of uh, most of the journal articles that you'll ever read they, they, they are revolve around three problems with business cycles one is, is, is you know strictly uh, that uh, that the business cycle has to come down to an end not that the economy is running hot or anything of that nature it's just that uh, you're gonna 
have exogenous shocks into the system. For instance, uh, the 1980s, when there was a uh, recession, the exogenous shock was the OPEC deal, right? So that causes an exogenous shock into the system. I think it's the 70s. Yeah, it might have been the 70s. I'm not exactly sure on the number right now. Um, I didn't research this because it's kind of something I do extemporaneously. Um, so my point is, is that exogenous shocks more than likely cause recessions. The only recession that's been an endogenous shock into the system was something of uh, the dot-com bust. Right? Now, secondly, to the, the boom and bust theory, you have to have a bust. There has to be, at some point in time, a boom to a bust, which they call the bubble. Now, Chicagoans are huge fans of the efficient market hypothesis, that the market signals everything it needs to signal within itself. There's no reason to assume that there's such a thing as a, as a boom or a bubble or a bust. Some things go up, some things go down. Uh, and Okay, the second part that I was talking about, the second type is structural and frictional. Same thing as you'll see with unemployment. You'll have a structural build within a country, and you'll have a technology frontier change, and that's going to cause a recession into the into the country. Again, .com. We, we've seen that where there was uh, a lot of these .com jobs were just not relevant anymore, so that all these people are being pulled out of the system. Aggregate demand is going to fall. So obviously there has to be something there, and it can't be that they were just caught on by these low interest rates, especially that these, these people, these, these number crunchers that are running these businesses in the, in the, in the 90s and the 2000s, which led to the 2000s and one bust, are, are not being able to look at this relevant data and say, oh, well, we're getting tricked. Um, and the third thing I'm going to point out is uh, the 2007, 2008, 2009, uh, the Great Recession, right? Before the Great Recession, there was an exogenous shock to oil prices. Now, this caused nominal gross domestic product to fall. Now, when nominal gross domestic product falls, aggregate demand falls because the income falls. Now, when all of those are combined, it had nothing to do with the, the overheating of the economy uh, in the uh, real estate market. Because you have to look at the real estate market and where it was affected. It's localized and it's centralized in places where we had high immigration numbers. Now, yes, those may cause some issues, but subprime mortgages were not big enough. And, and Ben Bernanke, to, to, uh, to, all of his, <laughs> to all of his chagrin, as much as he wrote in his book, The Courage to Act, to fight against it, not only did Volcker agree and Greenspan agree that, he had, that his policy for the subprime mortgages was wrong, I think we'll see in 10 years uh, a more mature Bernanke say that it was probably the fall of nominal gross domestic product that led to these that led to the bust of in the financial crisis. Um, so I, th I think that's about as much in the business cycle I really want to talk about because yeah. in Chicago it's just counter cyclical. Whatever the business cycle is going to be doing, yeah. we're going to try to not maneuver it as much as as uh the keynesians but we are going to know that there's going to be a time where we can have counter cyclical policy uh a recession a drop in demand we're gonna boost monetary policy and that will in fact create demand well i there is something the skyscraper theory which i think is pretty interesting and it goes back and it shows how you have like an explosion well kind of an explosion in the money supply interest rates drop People start, people think again, kind of what we would say fooled, quote unquote, and they build skyscrapers and uh, I forget who they were, but uh, they wrote a paper and it goes back to like the mid 1800s and they were able to correlate every single major uh, and record breaking skyscraper from the 1920s, 2021, 1910, 1928, 29, 30, that record breaking skyscrapers. Um, all the way up into 2005, you had Dubai, and the world-breaking sky record-breaking skyscraper had to be stopped. So I think the skyscraper does kind of show the real-world example of the business of the Austrian business cycle. And I, I know during Friedman's, I think it was his 90th birthday, Ben Bernanke spoke, and he said, "Hey, you know what? 
sorry, we did it. Right? He's con he was the chairman of the Fed. He's the supposedly the expert on the central banking, the Federal Reserve central bank. He wrote his paper on the Great Depression, his the his dissertation, and he said, yes, we at the Federal Reserve caused the Great Depression. Sorry, won't let it happen again. That's where he, I think that was where he got his helicopter Ben. Yes, that's it. where he got his Ben helicopter Ben. He said he if we ever got down to deflation, he would just dump money out helicopters for yes. for other other people. Um, and so as, as far as the shocks, again, 1920, you saw an explosion of the money supply, and there was a eh, dust bowl in the Midwest, but that was more in the 30s. Um, the What really happened is you had a sudden cutback, as Bernanke admitted, and Friedman also says that the Federal Reserve cut back the money supply that caused the Great Depression to begin in around 1930-31 is when it really began, and they didn't. Friedman's view was that they didn't extend the money supply back up to where they could have, and that would have created it. And the Austrian view is that wouldn't have mattered. What the problem was the intervention that they caused it through the 20s, expanding the money supply by, I think, like 65%, and then contracting it in 2930, and then continually letting it expand, and then contracting it, and then letting it expand, contracting it. And so you're creating this 12 year recession called the Depression that. You know, some people think got the World War II got us out of it, but it was really not World War II because it was much worse in World War II than it was in the Great Depression. In fact, uh, well, I won't get into that. But so, I think external shocks do play a role. <clears throat> but uh, what was the one you mentioned in ninety in the nineties? Well, actually, in the seventies, you have we also have Vietnam though. So we we're printing a lot of money in the sixties, seventy one. They went off the gold standard. You see a spike of inflation in the 70s, a big inflation going off the gold standard, plus printing a lot of money to pay for Vietnam. Um, and then in the 80s, you see the recession, the real estate recession, because they drove interest rates up, uh, eliminating the almost eliminating the ability of people to borrow money and buy houses. And in the 90s, you saw a big expansion of the money supply, low interest rates, causing the dot-com bubble. And of course, that would be an extent, external that could be a, a shock with a new technology, perhaps. But I think it's similarly in 2000, you just saw low interest rates driving people into homes and um, not necessarily just the subprime mortgage crisis, but the, the crisis altogether. That you know, low interest rates, again, drove people into houses. And then you get this like tulip type thing. where, And so this is kind of where I guess we would disagree on the idea of bubbles, whether they exist or not. Um, I do think bubbles do exist when you get this. Uh, what was Bernanke or was it Friedman or Bernanke, uh, Bernanke or Greenspan called it? Uh, uh, the craziness that went on, exuberation. Or, yeah, exuberation. well, it was uh, it was uh, Greenspan who called it mild exuberance at a froth of coffee, which was uh, kind of the point I was making about Greenspan didn't agree that it was this uh, that it was this big problem, and Bernanke up until about six months into the recession, also didn't use the subprime mortgage uh, and, and the financial crisis as a major problem. And um, this goes back to improper use of metrics, right? And this is something that that's came out of the Chicago School, which was getting ready to be my next talk about monetary theory. So, yeah, by the way, he did. He testified before Congress saying exactly what you said. Yeah, that, no big deal. No problem. Don't worry about it. Won't even notice it. Yeah. Uh, and and don't get me wrong, it would have still been a recession because, I mean, it, it, it was just wrapped up in a lot of things. But like the failure of Lehman Brothers and, and, and Bear Stearns and things of that nature, that had had a lot less to do with that and a lot more to do with uh, the fall of phenomenal gross domestic product, um, which is which is the point I'm getting ready to make. So when we, when we talk about money supply, and this has always been my, my big issue with Milton Friedman, who I'm probably the biggest fan of Milton Friedman as you could possibly find. I'm actually going to name my first son Milton. Uh, just, <laughs> just out there. Uh, but he even, in, in his later, a more, a more mature Milton Friedman, even stated that his monetary rules that he created, the K percent rule, um, his, his growth model for monetary policy were wrong. And they were. And they, they, they are 100% wrong. Uh, because money supply is a terrible metric, right? So if we could look at the M1, M2, M3, and M4 money supply, they would have absolutely no correlation to uh, inflation. 
that's that's just a that's just a point to make. Uh, uh, to look at this, we can look at uh, quantitative easing one, kind of two. It wasn't really as much about dumping money in the system as it was. It's called Operation Twist. It was about moving long-term interest rates uh, in line with short-term interest rates for uh, expectations. And quantitative easing three, which was a much much bigger uh, program to, to buy out and push money in the system. Uh, we actually saw and we have seen uh, very low inflation numbers since this happened. We, we, we've had inflation being pushed down since 2017. Uh, the, the inflation numbers are just now starting to move up past 1.5%. Uh, and this is not just uh, the government metric. This is private, private company metric. And based on Milton Friedman's theory of monetary policy, his K percent rule, we've had extreme amounts of hyperinflation. Uh, and, and the same with the Austrians, because the Austrians view inflation as directly tied to the money supply. Whereas market monetarists, which are the later version of the Chicago boys, view it as nominal gross domestic product. Money supply is a, a, a terrible metric to know what's going on with the demand for money, with the need for money. So they took the equation of exchange, which was uh, the quantity theory of money, and they added it and made it a little bit better with the Cambridge uh, quantity theory of money. So we actually have a demand for money. Now, it doesn't matter how much money you put into a system. If the demand for money is greater than the money supply itself, you're not going to have inflation. If you gave every man, woman, and child in the United States of America $1 trillion, but everyone only spent $1, that, that – uh, $999,999 billion doesn't go into the system, therefore it's not it's not in the money supply, it's not going to inflate. So all of this money that people are hoarding, which was which is the demand for money, as they hoard it, it's it's not going into the system. So that that's one of my biggest gripes with, with Austrian monetary theory, and that, that ties directly into why I don't agree with the Austrian business cycle. Because if we point at the money supply as the metric that we're using, you can extrapolate a lot. But if you if you legitimately take those two graphs and stack them on top of each other, there is no correlation between money supply, inflation, and the business cycle. They they propagate all in their own manner, where the only thing monetary policy does is smooth out business cycles by maintaining a, a decent level of inflation. And uh, for the counter cyclical, boosting aggregate demand by raising uh, the nominal gross domestic product. And, and it's really nominal gross domestic product level targeting is what we should do rather than inflation targeting because inflation targeting actually doesn't get to any serious point. You can undershoot inflation, you can overshoot inflation, whereas nominal gross domestic product, it, it, it's going to be 5% no matter what. Whether you have 1% of growth or whether you have 4% of growth, that number of domestic product will be at 5%. Now, that smooths out the business cycle much easier than uh, Friedman's K% percent rule. And that goes back to the new new age Chicago rules. So I, I actually think we do see a lot of inflation. First of all, we saw inflation. Now, the there's two kind of two ways to look at inflation. One is... The definition of inflation, what is it? And Friedman and I think Friedman as well, but the Austrians would say it's the growth in the money supply. So inflation is the growth in the money supply that then would cause prices to rise. And it's Friedman's formula, MV equals PY, right? That's the, the what is that, the monetary theory of? Uh, uh, that's the equation of exchange or also known as the quantity theory of money. Quantity theory of money, thank you. And so MV, that's money supply times velocity equals prices times GDP, and GDP growth is very, real GDP is fairly stable. And so any growth in the money supply would, and velocity being the time, number of times money turns over, that's actually how one money gets into the system, which is what you mentioned. And, yeah. and so that's why we see a massive inflation that's not yet coming into, into prices and but will come into prices so i think i think that it we will see a dramatic change in the price level over the next several years 
because what's happening to the money is that you have the Fed printing 10, 20 trillion dollars during the crisis. And a lot of the money went into banks. And where's the money going right now? Well, it's going in the stock market. So if you own stocks, you know, you've got the stock market at 21, 22,000. And so that's that's where we're seeing a lot of the money go into. So the, the price inflation is just in terms of stocks. But yeah. once it comes out of stocks and goes into the economy, then as you say, if you if you print a trillion dollars, you're three hundred million dollars. You give everybody one dollar, uh, and they they don't spend any of it. Then you're not going to cause. They just stick it under the mattress. Then yeah, you're not going to cause any change in the price level. But it's once they go and they spend the money. Now what the what the Fed has been doing is with that trillions of dollars they created, they stu- they gave it to the banks to prop up these dead these what is that weekend of Bernie style banks that are just walking dead uh, <clears throat> and to prop them up. And they've taken the money and instead of loaning it out like would typically happen, they stuck it in the market. So actually, I, I do like Friedman's view on that. Uh, in terms of money growth, he talked about having some kind of stable growth in the money supply that was equal to the population. I I would disagree with that because, again, I'm a hard hard money guy. So we can maybe we should get into that in a minute. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to make a final point on that and, uh, and, and and point to some of the issues of, of Norman Friedman and uh, the Austrians when it comes to NV equals PY and why the new Chicago boys really had to change it. So for the longest time, we always assumed velocity to be uh, stable, right? Velocity is one whenever we do you know, our intermediate intermediate macro work. It's It's one. It's always going to be one or some constant number, right? Well, the problem is velocity isn't constant. It, it, it can't be constant. That doesn't make any sense for the, the demand for money to be a constant because that's what velocity is. Velocity is the demand for money, how much money we're willing to continuously put through. And, and it changes from household to household. So uh, in, in times of booms, obviously the proclivity for – Rich people is to invest in poor people's to spend. Um, and that, that goes back to Friedman's permanent income hypothesis. And, and, and inverse is true during recessions, right? So that alone tells us that there's not a, 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 a constant to velocity. And that's a major problem in, in the NV equals PY. Now, what NV equals PY does tell us is not gross domestic product, but it tells us nominal gross domestic product. Because we've got the money supply times the price level, or uh, well, yeah, money supply times price level quantity uh, times that. So it, and then inflation price level times GDP. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if you, yeah, if you divided by price level, you would get real GDP. Yeah. Price times yeah. yeah. Price times uh, that in the uh, money times velocity equals. I had to write it down. Price times. Uh, Income. Yeah, or national income. Real, and, and again, for anybody watching, it's real. GDP is gross domestic product, the monetary value of goods and services within a nation's borders, right? And real GDP, which is when you take out inflation. So just yeah. throw that in there, just for clarity for anybody watching. Okay, now, and and we and you said that inflation is what what you use as the definition of inflation as the increase in the money supply. I, I disagree with that. I reject that because that's how dare that has been the definition. That has been the definition in quite some time. It's a general increase in prices and the fall of the purchasing value of money. So, and that that, that doesn't go back into the money supply again. The money supply is a terrible metric because that doesn't play into how inflation actually works you can have infinite amount of money and unless the unless the demand is equal and it comes to an equilibrium or well that's kind of so that's again the, the price level versus inflation inflation has a direct consequence in the price level right and so the more money that's printed the, the more the higher the price level will go in general now they banks have all kinds of ways to try to manipulate that by where the money actually gets stuck. Again, if they give it to banks. And then we saw that in 2008, they started paying banks to hold money at the central depositories. And that, that was a way that they increased the money supply and then decreased the money supply at the same time. 
So, but so again, this is just kind of a, a difference in the definition of what inflation is or disagreement on that, I guess. <laughs> and inflation is most felt when you have children and they grow out of their old clothes. I think you would probably get that. <laughs> or diapers, you feel inflation. So I think most people out there would also agree that we actually have seen inflation. That is that we've seen the, the effect of inflation in terms of the prices at the grocery store and, and other things. Now, in a capitalist economy, were it not for the growth in the money supply, there would be no inflation. In, in a hard money currency, maybe we'll, we'll have to bring that as a whole separate topic. We can talk about hard money because we, uh, hard money versus paper money, commodity money versus paper money origination and things like that. But I was saying in a, in a capitalist economy, we'd, we would see the prices of everything go down, but because we do have inflation, it's hiding the true cost of goods. So we, the cost of, I was, I was saying that you, you would most feel inflation having children, right? Because you, she grows out of clothes and you're like, oh my God, I got to pay how much for a dress, right? <laughs> things like that. Yeah. And those things should go down, right? The price of those should go down, except a hidden inflation, which is were they were it not for the increase in the money supply, prices would go down, but instead prices are going up at 1% when they should go down by 1% or in the areas that we actually spend our money, prices are going up a much greater amount than 1%. I think you, you would, because again, I only, just two of us, so I don't, you know, but I think you would feel, you would know more than I that prices are changing. Um, to that, so once again, I go back, I, I have not seen any change to the price level, to be honest. I've actually, Talked about the undershoot, uh, the undershot of inflation throughout uh, the, the 2000s. Uh, that goes back to oil prices and the exotic shocks that have that have affected us. Um, now, to that, uh, in the in the long run, uh, how prices should fall over time. So, I don't know how you feel about monetary neutrality, but under monetary neutrality, that's that's not going to happen. The prices are going to fall, and they're not going to increase, which they haven't. Monetary neutrality is absolutely true. So we say that our basket of goods now is worth, uh, this is not an exact number, this is just a bar figure, 100% more than they were in 1980, right? So yeah, I think you can actually go to bls.gov for anybody that watches this, and you can look at the value of a dollar in near X and what it takes to buy it. Yeah, you can go to Wolfram Alpha and it will give you your, 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 your uh, price change. But that, the, the point I'm trying to make is, is in, uh, I was actually talking to a guy earlier today about auctionism, and this was one of the points I brought up, he brought up price level change, is that if you go to 1984, a Chevy Cavalier, which is the exact same as a, a modern uh, Malibu, they stopped the Cavalier and made the Malibu, uh, costed $8,494, whereas a 2017 Chevy Malibu costs Roughly twenty one thousand dollars, depending on what kind of package you're gonna get. Uh, now, yeah, and there's hedonics that hide the actual changes. Well, the, the the point I'm trying to make is is that the production value and the factors have changed so much that if you looked at how much the car. How much the car would cost then versus now, uh, it, you would have a huge, huge uh, difference in price. Prices and factors of, of, of cost have gone down. The purchasing power of, of money has not changed in the long run. The same amount of money and the same amount of income that you have used to buy a car in 1984 is similar, if not just a little bit less than what it was in, in, uh, in 1984 versus now in 2017. So inflation can go up infinitely. And as long as the power purchase of that money is the exact same, then there's no reason to worry about how much the 
the uh, loss of the dollar is because the money supply will grow equal to the loss of the dollar, which means income will equal what is lost in the dollar. So one dollar is worth this and a hundred years from that. In, generally, in a capitalist free market economy, you, have, you would not have that. You would have, uh, well, yeah, the real price level should stay generally constant in terms of prices of goods, but at the same time, incomes would actually increase. So real incomes would increase. And we've seen that since 1980, real incomes, contrary to what many on the left would say, real income has actually gone up quite a bit significantly. I think uh, in terms of purchasing power, things you can buy, what you can buy, cell phones, you know, I mean, just life is generally better for the average person than, uh, I just, I can go on. I'm just kind of cutting in when you grab her. So, okay, so uh, a lot of the technological advances that should have driven the price of all these things would be down, while incomes would also increase because we're becoming more productive and productivity leads to wage growth. We should actually, the price of these cars should actually be dramatically cheaper than they are, were it not for inflation. And according to the Fed's own numbers, there has been an average of about 2 or 3% inflation since the creation of the Fed in 1913, and it's actually been about 4% since we went off the gold standard. Yeah. Maybe we could talk about uh, hard versus currency money on a, at a different time, but I don't know if you wanted to... Should I just give a last statement? Did you want to say a last? Uh, we still got 15 minutes more. Uh, she's all right. She's just she's yeah, three and a half. Oh, okay. Well, dang. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, um, again, because we're just going off the business cycle, I would refer to the skyscraper theory. Uh, Mises talks about the master builder and how low interest rates make him think he can build a five-story house, but in reality, he only has so much stuff to build a three-story house, it's good. It would be better for him to learn the real price of money or price, and again, money gives it, the price, uh, interest rate. interest rates give information on relative scarcity of goods and money, you know, loanable funds, which supposed to be give you information. So, yeah, what you said, supposed to give you a supply and demand model for available money, but because we have a central bank coming in and printing a lot of money and driving and creating interest rates, whether it should be up here, but then they drive them way down here and they make up the difference. It, that's how we see kind of the fooling of the entrepreneur into thinking he has much more to deal with than he actually does. And so the uh, I think most Austrians would probably, well, in general, say get rid of a central bank, go to more of a free market money. And actually, I wouldn't even talk about that, but I'd love to get into how money is created and so, yeah, if anybody's interested, I would I would just kind of go skyscraper theory. I think that would really interest anybody as far as the Austrian business cycle. So, the last two minutes. Okay. Um, so my final is that uh, everyone should reject the Austrian business cycle. How dare you, sir? You are. <laughs> I learned that all you need. There's no empirical evidence to support it. No journal, no journal that I know of has published a paper by an Austrian on the on the cycle theory outside of something outside of some wonky uh, journal that's specifically for this, even at George Mason university with their PhD program, they have to be very, very careful about their dissertations because if they promote the business cycle too much. <laughs> and that money is different than people think. <laughs> Now, uh, well, Walter Block has several articles published. And I don't, he's got like 600 articles published. I'm not sure if any of them are what, what specifically they are. Maybe one of them is. Who's that? Walter Block, Dr. Walter Block. He's an Austrian economist. In fact, I have his link below. I posted a link of him speaking. And he's uh, he's bad-mouthing you guys on the link below. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's fine. Nobody cares about Austrian in, in actual economics anyway. They're just like yeah, you know, uh, yeah. so we are we are a small but growing school. You know, we kind of grew out of the Ron Paul movement, and so uh, as libertarians grow, they tend to go towards the Austrians. Like I said, if you're one, you will soon become the other. Right. It's inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we only got twenty seconds left, Joe. Um, nice to chat with you again. 
Yeah. Y'all have You'll a good understand someday. Right. I know, right? Y'all have a good day. All right. And come Saturday. You and see, baby. Good night. Take care. <laughs>